Hi Year 6, uh, hope you're well. Back for another online learning session today we're going to be looking at science. Um, so as you know we started our topic um, on evolution and inheritance and loads of you have done some really really good research about Charles Darwin um, and about some other aspects of um, evolution and inheritance. I've had some really good uh, comprehensions um, and little sections of work that you've been completing about that and I know that Shona has as well so we're really pleased with what you sent so far. Um, if you haven't sent anything yet, please do upload some of your work to Shobi. We'd be really keen to see it. Um, and yeah, after today's lesson, hopefully you'll have some more things to think about. Um, there will be a lot of vocab in this lesson. Uh, so don't worry if you find it a little bit confusing or overwhelming. Um, you can always re-watch the video um, and there's going to be an activity at the end uh, for you to... Um, do some vocabulary work that will help you to kind of embed that into your your dictionary in your brain. Um, so don't worry about that and uh, here we go. So science. All you will need um, is a pen or a pencil and some paper. Everything else is in the video. Um, as with the other videos there uh, will be opportunities for you to pause the video and to com complete an activity or think about something um, that I've asked you. Obviously, normally you'd talk to a talk partner in that um, instance, but for now, just have a little think. Um, or if you are watching with a sibling or with a parent, then you can have a chat with them. So starting off with, of course, what is science? Hit pause, have a think. Okay, so science is the system of studying, testing and experimenting on things in nature. Um, it's a search for general laws about the way the world works. Uh, and that's a very broad obviously definition of science um, but it's a good way to um, to enter into the study of it because having your head in the right space is really important. So we've been looking at the science, working scientific skills uh, so far this year. We've done um, quite a lot on research and on observation and on classifying um, but what are all five of these working scientific skills? Hit pause, have a think. Okay, hopefully you got them. You've got observing over time, grouping and classifying, researching, pattern seeking, comparative and fair testing. So it's always important to have um, those in your mind. And we're going to be looking specifically today um, at classifying, observing over time, um, really, as the main the main areas that we're looking at, that we're looking at. Um, but obviously, as we know, when we're studying any scientific topic, um, we are always considering all of those skills um, in what we're doing. So evolution and inheritance. First of all, we're going to start with an intro from David Attenborough, uh, because he is obviously very famous for all of his uh, work in terms of science in the natural world. Um, and this video, which you probably have seen before, I think we've watched it in class, um, The Tree of Life, is a really, really good explanation of how the world life on earth has evolved. So here we go. A hundred and fifty years after the publication of Darwin's revolutionary book, modern genetics has confirmed its fundamental truth. All life is related. And it enables us to construct with confidence the complex tree that represents the history of life. It began in the sea some 3,000 million years ago. Complex chemical molecules began to clump together to form microscopic blobs, cells. These were the seeds from which the tree of life developed. They were able to split, replicating themselves as bacteria do. And as time passed, they diversified into different groups. Some remained attached to one another so that they formed chains. We know them today as algae. Others formed hollow balls which collapsed upon themselves, creating a body with an internal cavity. They were the first multicelled organisms. Sponges are their direct descendants. As more variations appeared, the tree of life grew and became more diverse. Some organisms became more mobile and developed a mouth that opened into a gut. Others had bodies stiffened by an internal rod. 
They, understandably, developed sense organs around their front end. A related group had bodies that were divided into segments with little projections on either side that helped them to move around on the sea floor. Some of these segmented creatures developed hard protective skins which gave their bodies some rigidity. So now the seas were filled with a great variety of animals. And then around 450 million years ago, some of these armored creatures crawled up out of the water and ventured onto land. And here, the tree of life branched into a multitude of different species that exploited this new environment in all kinds of ways. One group of them developed elongated flaps on their backs, which over many generations eventually developed into wings. The insects had arrived. Life moved into the air and diversified into myriad forms. Meanwhile, back in the seas, those creatures with the stiffening rod in their bodies had strengthened it by encasing it in bone. A skull developed with a hinged jaw that could grab and hold on to prey. They grew bigger and developed fins equipped with muscles that enabled them to swim with speed and power. So fish now dominated the waters of the world. One group of them developed the ability to gulp air from the water surface. Their fleshy fins became weight-supporting legs, and 375 million years ago, a few of these backbone creatures followed the insects onto the land. They were amphibians with wet skins, and they had to return to water to lay their eggs. But some of their descendants evolved dry, scaly skins and broke their link with water by laying eggs with watertight shells. These creatures, the reptiles, were the ancestors of today's tortoises, snakes, lizards, and crocodiles. And of course, they included the group that, back then, came to dominate the land, the dinosaurs. But 65 million years ago, a great disaster overtook the Earth. Whatever its cause, a great proportion of animals were exterminated. All the dinosaurs disappeared except for one branch, whose scales had become modified into feathers. They were the birds. While they spread through the skies, a small, seemingly insignificant group of survivors began to increase in numbers on the ground beneath. These creatures differed from their competitors in that their bodies were warm and insulated with coats of fur. They were the first mammals. With much of the land left vacant after the great catastrophe, they now had their chance. Their warm, insulated bodies enabled them to be active at all times, at night as well as during the day, and in all places, from the Arctic to the tropics. In water, as well as on land, on grassy plains and up in the trees. Today, we and the rest of the mammals share the world with the descendants of those other great animal groups that have evolved on this planet, with birds, with reptiles, with insects and with fish, and even with those simplest of all living organisms that first appeared over 3,000 million years ago with bacteria. Okay, so it's so fascinating. Um, this topic, I will, we are barely scratching the surface of this topic because it is... Um, scientists have spent their lives dedicated to to finding out about um, evolution and about how life on Earth has evolved. So it is something that if you are interested in, it you can really research and read about and find out more about because all I'm all that we have to learn in Year Six are the very very basic um, scientific concepts that underpin that. So 
um, it is definitely something that if you're interested in, please go away and research, read about it, find out more, watch all of David Attenborough's programmes because they are fascinating. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I think, one of the most interesting topics that you will learn about in school. So let's carry on. So as I said, we're just going to be learning some of the scientific concepts that underpin the theory of evolution. Um, and before we start doing that, there are a few things that you need to know. They're not, um, you don't need to know them in detail, but they're, vo they're vocabulary areas that will come up again and again. And they're things that you will learn out about a lot more when you get to secondary school. Um, but it's just important that we touch on them very briefly. So we're looking at cells, chromosomes, DNA and genes. So we're not going to be looking at this in massive detail. But these are the building blocks for life, okay? So it's important to kind of have a, a basic grasp of what they are. So cells, as you know, are the building blocks of all living things. So all living things are made up of cells. Amoebas have one cell and humans have trillions of cells. And we touched on this a little bit when we were doing um, animals including humans and we were looking um, at the circulatory system and different parts of the body. So cells are the building blocks of all living things. The nucleus of a cell, so in the middle, you can see here, contains chromosomes which are made up of DNA. Now you've heard about DNA a lot because obviously we talk, that's probably one of the things in science that we talk about um, just generally in popular culture because it comes up a lot. So DNA carries the, the characteristics that we inherit. It's located in two places in the cell, the nucleus and the mitochondria. DNA can replicate and make copies of itself. And when cells divide, each cell needs to have an exact copy of the DNA in the old cell. So somebody described this to me as a little bit like the microchip of the cell. It has all of the important information stored in it. That's a good way to think about it. Genes are short sections of DNA that contain specific information. And this is often called the genetic code. All the genes in the whole cell are called the genome. So... Obviously, this, this is quite advanced. Um, you don't need to know this in year six, but it's just so that you've got, heard this, this vocabulary before. Um, if you want to find out more about it, um, go on to Twinkle, go on to DK Find Out, just go and check out uh, some of those websites we've been using because you'll be able to explore a little bit more. BBC Bite Size as well has got some fantastic um, resources uh, with regards to this area of science. So just so you've heard that vocabulary, but please do research more if you're interested. So moving on to inheritance. What does it mean to inherit something? Hit pause and have a think. Okay, so if you looked up inherit, the verb in the dictionary, uh, you'll have two definitions. We've got the first one, to receive something, money, property or a title as an heir at the death of the previous holder. Um, that's probably the instance that you've heard this word used a lot before. Um, or it means to derive genetically from one's parents or ancestors. And that's a quality, a characteristic, or a, a disposition. So we often mean things that are passed on to us when one of our relatives or friends died. Um, inherited items are sometimes houses or important objects. We have touched on this a little bit um, in a couple of the books that we were reading earlier in the year. But this is not the scientific definition of inheritance, okay? So important in science, because we, there was a lot of crossover vocabulary, it's important to recognise that we, although we use that word in, in sort of everyday life, this is not the scientific definition of it. In science, inheritance refers to the genes that are passed on from parents to offspring, so to their children. When we refer to inherited characteristics, we tend to focus on physical characteristics, because um, these are easy to spot, for example... Um, your eye colour or um, your the fact that you've got freckles. Um, the inherited characteristics can also include abilities such as taste um, and smell. And this is not just um, for humans, this is all living things. So just based on these pictures, can you match the parents with the offspring? Hit pause, have a try. Okay, it's a fairly easy activity to do, isn't it? We can see the resemblances between the parent and the offspring. And that's because they have physical similarities or they have characteristics that are the, are the same. So you can look at the owl and then the owl's baby. They have a similar shaped face. We've got this, the, the um, 
this sort of heart shape. We've got the eyes um, and the beak structure, which is very similar. Similarly with the seal and then the seal pup, We've got the same uh, body parts, haven't they? Unlike the owl, which has got wings, they've got uh, blubber and flippers to be able to go into the um, into the water. Okay, so we can basically see the inherited characteristics, the physical characteristics, just by looking at a parent and its offspring. However, just so that you don't get um, confused or have a misconception, while offspring does mean child, it does not mean that you're only offspring when you're children, okay? So the inherited characteristics that you gain from your parents are part of your DNA, so that microchip inside all your cells, for life. So even when you're an adult, you are your parents' child. You're still their offspring, okay? So even if um, your grandparent, for example, if their parent is no longer around, they are still the offspring of that person, okay? So it doesn't ever go away. So, inheritance and variation. How can inherited characteristics, so similarities between parent and offspring, result in variation, or differences? Well, the majority of living things are the result of reproduction from two parents. So you inherit the characteristics from both parents, but the way that they combine makes the offspring unique. So as we know, if you, um, what would not happen is you wouldn't have the top half of your body looking like your mum and the bottom part of your body looking like your dad. That's not how um, inherited characteristics work, okay? So you would inherit characteristics from both, but they will combine in a way that makes you unique, okay? Or the offspring unique. So they combine in different ways, which is the reason why siblings, they inherit the same characteristics, but they're not identical. Now you might think, if you do have a sibling, you might think that you know that there are similarities between the two of you, but you're not exactly the same in any way. Um, and even identical twins that share the exact same combination of DNA, they're not 100% the same. So even though their little microchip inside their cells is the same because they, they, the cells split so early on, um, this is due to the fact that the genes develop separately when the twins are embryos, or so when they're in their mother's um, womb and growing they develop separately, so they're not developing in exactly the same way, okay? So I know a few um, sets of twins and of identical twins, and it's always really, they get very frustrated if people say that they're the same, because obviously they're not, they are different, um, not in, only in terms of personality, but physically they have a different, they've developed differently, okay? So it's really important to always think back to that when you're thinking about variation. So... We often talk about inheriting characteristics or traits from our parents. Um, however, it's not always the case that these are passed on through DNA. Some are learned as we grow up. So there's this nature-nurture um, balance. So some things that you inherit and you're born with and you are destined to have, and other things that you develop as a result of growing up in a certain environment. Okay? So, for example, I grew up um, in a house where my mum really loves music and plays the piano. Um, I also really love music, but that is not an inherited characteristic in my DNA. That is part of the experiences that I had. They're acquired characteristics, okay? So things that you acquire, things that you, you gain um, as a result of your experience, okay? So on the next slide, there are some uh, cards that have different characteristics. And I want you to think about whether they are inherited, so you're born with them, or whether they are acquired, so you gain them as a result of experience. Okay, hit pause and think really carefully about each one. Okay, so hopefully uh, you had a think about that. So tongue rolling, this one is quite popular, um, I know, in school. Um, you can either do this or you can't, which I didn't realise until I was fairly old. Um, so you can't learn how to do that. Uh, you, you, you're able to do it. You inherit the ability to do it. Uh, your hair colour. Obviously you can dye your hair, but you are very unlikely or not going to have ginger hair, for example, if both your parents have got very, very dark brown hair. Okay? So it's something that is inherited. It's in your DNA. Your eye colour is also... Um, inherited and it's important to say that it might not necessarily be inherited from your parent directly 
because obviously your parent is the offspring of their parent. And so you may inherit characteristics that come from your grandparent that perhaps weren't as obvious in your parents' um, makeup when they when they were born. Okay, so um, that's something to bear in mind. It's quite complicated, but it's interesting. A cleft chin, dimples, freckles. Okay, they're all things that are inherited. You can't choose to have freckles unless you draw them onto yourself. Um, you can't say I want to have freckles and the next day will have them. Um, whereas acquired characteristics you can gain. So the ability to play a musical instrument, we all know that this is the outcome of a lot of hard work. Some people seem to take to it better than others, but um, it is something that you acquire as a result of experience. Swimming, drawing, reading, singing, riding a bike, they're all things that anyone can learn to do. Okay, so they're not inherited, they are acquired. So on to adaptation. So we touched a little bit on variation. Variation in its most basic definition means difference, okay? So in science, the things that cause variation are the combination of inheritance and ad adaptation. So inheritance, the, th the characteristics that offspring inherit from their parents, so we just touched on those, eye colour, etc. But adaptation are characteristics that are influenced by the environment that the living thing lives in. Okay, so if you've done your research on Charles Darwin, you will know that he studied in the Galapagos Isles um, the finches and the beaks of the finches and how um, they were different shapes and different sizes depending on what they were eating, what, they're, what they were preying on. Okay, and that was an, an adaptation that was influenced by the particular environment of where they were getting their food. So there's a variation, a difference between the two finches based on the environment that they have adapted to, okay? So inherited characteristics can be adapted over time, which leads to variation within a species, okay? So, environments and habitats. What is an environment? What is a habitat? Hit pause, have a think. Okay, so sometimes the words environment and habitat are used as though they have the same meaning. We do this a lot just in our general, our general speak. However, it's really important to note that there are differences between the, those two definitions in terms of science, okay? So a habitat refers to a specific area or place in which animals and plants can live. An environment contains many habitats and includes areas where there are both living and non-living things, okay? So just reread those definitions, check that you understand that there is a difference between the two things. So a bird may live in the woods, its habitat, but its environment could include a stream, a mountain, which are habitats in their own right, and there'll be animals that live in those particular habitats that are also a part of that environment, okay? Just hit pause and reread that slide, or re-listen to that slide, because it is slightly confusing to get your head around. Okay, so what different types of habitats are there? Now, this is something that I know that you would have done um, in year two and year three, uh, looking at different types of habitats. And there is an excellent song on Hopscotch, uh, which I have put onto the um, the playlist um, on our YouTube channel, so check it out. Uh, we've got polar regions, deserts, coniferous forests, tropical rainforests, oceans, grasslands, mountains, and a heath. Remember, an environment is more than one habitat, okay? It's confusing, I, I know, but just Keep, keep remembering that. An environment is made up of more than one habitat. So what does adapted mean? Hit pause, have a think. What do you think adapted means? Okay, let's see what these children thought. So the first child, adapted means to adjust to new conditions, like a new home or a school. Okay. Second child, adapted is when you turn a book into a TV programme or a film. Okay, third person. Adapted means making something suitable for a new purpose, like cutting off the legs of jeans to make them into shorts. Okay, so we've got three different definitions here of adapted. What do you think? Are any of these correct? Are all of them correct? Is just one of them correct? Are two of them correct? Have a think. Okay, 
All three of them are correct, but none of these are the scientific meaning of adapted. So again, we're going back to this need to make sure that we can distinguish between the scientific definition of something and the definition that we give it in everyday life, in everyday conversation. OK, it's a little bit like maths in that sense. You know, if I say that I'm going to split this in half with you, I don't actually mean half. I mean into two parts that are likely to be not equal. Yeah. So the scientific definition of adaptation. When you see a fish swimming in its habitat, it's noticeable that it is suited to it. So ways that fish are suited to living in water. They've got gills to breathe in the water. They've got fins that allow them to move through the water easily. They have a special... Um, bladder called a swim bladder which allows it to remain buoyant in the water so that means like floating in the water yeah so they're suited to living in that water they're they're um they they're scientifically adapted to do so so it's easy to think that the fish has adapted or changed to suit its habitat or environment but this is not correct no living thing can deliberately change to adapt to an environment if you think about it if you wanted to change and live in the sea you wouldn't be able to grow fins yeah, or a tail or gills. If you were in the water long enough, would you start to develop gills? The answer for both of those is no, obviously, um, but you would drown. So even though it may seem hard to believe, this fish has developed all of these features accidentally, not intentionally or deliberately. And this hasn't happened overnight. This has happened over generations and generations of evolution. So change, yeah, adapting to live in a particular environment. Yeah, so that is why you could not turn into a mermaid um, just because you were in the water for 24 hours. Yeah. The adaptations, each of which occurred over time, that's called evolution, make it easier for the fish to live in water and survive. We only see the fish as it is now, not the other fish who started off similar to it, but whose adaptations made it harder rather than easier to live in the water. And these fish will have become extinct as a result. And we know that extinct means that they have died out, yeah? So we can only see the one who survived. This is that we human were heard of the survival of the fittest. Fit for purpose, basically, is what that means. You know, able to live and survive in a particular environment. The other versions of the fish before, before it became as adap well adapted as it, is, as it is now, they no longer exist because they've become extinct. They, are, they couldn't survive in that habitat. So the successful adaptations allowed the fish to survive in the water better, hence the fact that this particular fish is still alive now. Okay, So adaptation is not part of a living thing. It is a process. It is a process that happens over time, over a long period of time. It doesn't just happen quickly. A parent and then a child, that generational difference, you, adaptation wouldn't happen significantly enough in that time period in order for um, the fish to survive, for example. Um, the parts of the living thing that have changed, they are called adaptive traits. So we know that a trait is like a characteristic, so something about you. Um, and adaptive obviously means changed. So how do these random accidental adaptations occur? The usual cause is random mutation, and mutation means to change, okay? So we need to go back to our DNA, back to that little microchip that is inside all of our cells. Each cell has a copy of the DNA. Random mutations occur when the cell becomes damaged and fails to repair itself completely. Sometimes this failure affects the DNA in the cell. So in this situation, the DNA stays slightly different. So it's changed and it can't repair. So it's damaged beyond but repair. So then it becomes mutated and it stays like that. So when the cell with the DNA that has been mutated replicates or, you know, copies itself, um, it does so with the mutation, okay? So that sort of change, the mutation itself, is not good or bad. Some mutations have no effect whatsoever, and other mutations can cause us to lose or gain functions. So a really good example of this is the ability of humans to drink milk after infanthood, so after they're a baby. So we know that mammals um, drink milk from their mother uh, when they're born, yeah? And the process of no longer drinking milk is called weaning. And we know that all other mammals stop drinking milk after they've weaned, okay? So after, they hurt, they're, after they're ready to be able to eat food, they stop and then they become lactose intolerant. So the body stops being able to digest milk. 
and a mutation in humans has allowed us to carry on drinking milk even after we are weaned as babies. And further mutation means that we can drink the milk of other mammals, such as cows, sheep and goats. Okay, so if you drink milk, you most likely will drink um, milk from an animal. A cow, cow's milk is the most common from the supermarket, um, sheep and goats. Um, and no other mammals do this. No other mammal drinks the milk of another animal. Okay, so it's a, it's a mutation, it's a change that has allowed us to carry on drinking milk, um, which is... I mean, it's neither good nor bad, really, is it? Because obviously we've become used to it, um, but our survival is not uh, dependent on it, neither is it harmful to us. Okay, so adaptive traits enable a living thing to survive better in its habitat or environment, and as it lives longer, it means that it has a greater chance of reproducing, and so the adaptive trait gets passed on. Okay, so what you're going to do is to try and put this into practice, I've given you eight animals, eight habitats, and eight adaptive traits that you're going to match up. And I want you to lay your work out in a table in your book, okay? So you've got living thing, you'll put the living thing, then the habitat, and then the adaptive trait, okay? Just write out the names and then the definition of the adaptive trait. And then the next one, new line, new animal, or living thing, new habitat, and then the adaptive trait, okay? So, there, you can see, this is a small, small version of it. I'll go on to the next page where they're is the full version. Spend, I don't know, 10 minutes doing this, uh, or as long as it takes you really. Um, hit pause and make sure to lay your work out nice and clearly because in the next two slides um, I will have the, the answers, the matched up um, living things, habitats and um, adaptive traits. Okay, off you go. Okay, time to have a look at the answers. So we've got a polar bear, the habitat it lives in is the Arctic, and the adaptive trait is its white fur enables it to camouflage in the snow. So we know that that is different to a brown bear, for example, the ones that we looked at when we were um, looking at animals in North America, um, because that a brown bear would not camouflage in the snow, would it? Then we've got a camel um, in the desert. It has wide feet that make it easier to walk in the sand. If you think about how that's different to a horse, a horse would struggle to walk um, on the sand in the desert. A cactus also lives in the desert and it can store water in its stem. I know that you know a lot about this because obviously it doesn't rain very often, um, if at all, um, in the desert um, in some places. And so it has to store the water that it can inside its stem to keep itself alive. A toucan lives in the rainforest. It's got a narrow tongue that allows it to eat small fruit and insects. Hedgehog lives in the woods. It has spines to protect itself. It's also kind of camouflaged if you think about what a pine cone looks like. Um, not dissimilar to a hedgehog if you saw one on the floor. Um, dolphins, they live in the ocean and they have nostrils on the top of their heads so that they only have to break the water to breathe. So they don't have to come out and sit on the beach to breathe. They can just go up to the surface and then just break the top of the water, breathe and then go back down again. Coral. Habitat is a coral reef. It contains toxins that make, so that's like poison, that make it unappetizing to certain predators. So certain things that might want to eat it, um, it's actually poisonous to them. So um, it stops them from wanting to eat it. An ash tree, type of tree, um, is in the forest and it has broad leaves which enable it to catch more sunlight. So we know that um, through photosynthesis, trees turn uh, the sun's energy um, you know, they use the sun's energy in order then they produce oxygen. So in order, if they have a bigger leaf in a dense forest where they're not necessarily going to get as much sunlight if there are lots of trees all um, sort of pushed up together, uh, the broader the leaves, the more chance they have of absorbing that sunlight uh, for photosynthesis. OK. So let's have a little think about humans. What habitats do humans live in? Are there any habitats that they're not able to live in? We touched on this, I think uh, someone the other, other week was saying about how there are certain places on Earth that humans can't survive, uh, which, is, which is correct. Uh, but can you identify adaptive traits that humans have which enable them to live in such a range of different habitats and environments? So I'm not going to ask you to write, sort of write this up now, but it's something to think about, isn't it? Because you can have a think about people who live in different environments they have adapted, they have um, evolved, if, if you like, to, in order to, in order to um, live in that environment. So as a follow-up for that, I'd like you to 
first of all make a start on the uh, packs that Shona has created for you about adaptation and variation. Um, they're, they're either have been sent out or will being sent, be being sent out today um, via your um, parent and carer emails. So make a start on those because there's, there's lots of practice for you to explore adaptation and variation. And then once you've done that, spend some time researching what habitats humans live in and any that they're not able to live in. Identify the adaptive traits that humans have which enable them to live in such a range of different habitats and environments. Okay, so we as humans, uh, we live all over the world in lots and lots of different environments and what is it that has enabled us to do that? How have What adaptive traits have humans developed in order to be able to survive in those environments? Okay, so those are your follow-up activities. So you can hit pause and write those things down in your book so that you know what you're going to do. Um, if you want to complete some research, please obviously do send it in to us at via Shobi, um, and we'd be we'd love to look at it. Uh, however, if you're feeling a bit confused by all of this, I don't blame you. There's a lot of scientific and vocabulary involved in the study of evolution and inheritance. So, and it's really important you understand that vocabulary in order to access the learning for this topic fully. Um, so, if you are finding this a bit confusing, before you do the follow-up activities, spend and even actually everyone should do this because it will just be good for you. Spend some time looking up these words that I've got here. Okay, write the definition down and make sure that you then write a sentence using the word in the context of science. Okay, so that you really do understand what it means. And if you want me to, I'll show you to have a look at this. Please take a photo, send it in to us um, on Shobi because we can check if there's any. Um, issues that you've got going on there okay so it is confusing but it's also very very interesting um, and I think you'll have a lot of questions some of which I'll be able to answer some of which you'll be able to answer yourselves by going away doing some research doing some reading going on BBC Bite Size and just trying to find out a little bit more about this really interesting topic okay so that's the end of uh, the lesson from me obviously go back over the video um, Hit pause again on the bits that you found tricky, reread some of the sections that were hard, um, and then complete the follow-up activities so that you're really secure on this topic. It is so interesting. Um, the video for David Attenborough is from uh, the Wellcome Trust, so it is available on YouTube. Just search Tree of Life David Attenborough. Um, and then all of these other resources are from Twinkle. So if you want to go on the Twinkle website, download any more information, then uh, please do. Obviously, keep sending us your work. We really love seeing it. It's really nice to see how many of you are doing so much good work at home. Um, it makes it really, it makes us feel connected with you still. So that's really great. Well done. Uh, so good luck and see you soon.